Quick Goal, the official goal of soccer, presents Quick Chat, a quick-hitting interview series with some of the top people from around the soccer world. We discover how coaches got to their position and advice they give to a younger self. Welcome to Quick Chat. Hey everyone, how we doing? Uh, here with Chris Arnold, the 2019 Club Champions League Boys Coach of the Year. How we doing, Chris? I'm doing great, Eric. Thank you for for having me on. I really appreciate it. I uh, look forward to to having a great conversation with you. Good. Let's talk some shop. Um, take us back, Chris. Kind of talk about you know how you got your start, how you got from the beginning to where you are now. Yeah, I mean, whenever I get a chance to kind of reflect back on on my coaching journey, I, I look back to growing up in New Orleans and my coaches uh, at uh, New Orleans Soccer Academy. So we were a soccer club uh, that went by NOSA. Uh, and I look back to my coaches, Mark Nichols and Robin Dixon, mm-hmm. um, who are still doing very well in the coaching uh, world. But I find myself very fortunate, actually, to have grown up in New Orleans that isn't necessarily known for soccer in the South, uh, but we had a very unique uh, setup and experience that uh, those guys who I mentioned uh, created for us as players. Uh, And I, 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 you know, over time, I've talked to a lot of coaches who sort of get into the coaching uh, environment and world because of negative experiences maybe that they've had with a coach. And for me, it's really uh, looking back on the positive experiences that I had from from coaches growing up who just really set a, they had a big influence on me. And uh, again, when I look back on it, things like building a culture, building rapport with players and, and really uh, building confidence in players was something that I just, that really stands out to me they had a tendency to make us feel as players that we were the best players in the world. And right. it's something that, again, as I, I reflect back, it's something that I carry on with me for sure. My individual coaching journey really started when I went to college. Um, so I went to UNC Charlotte uh, down in North Carolina. And really during my playing days at uh, Charlotte, I, you know, I always took a liking to like camps, summer camps, and even to a point where I, I took over a U9 rec team for a year. And I, I would say that during that time, I, I wasn't really serious about it, but it sort of introduced me to what it's like to, to be on the other end, right? As a, uh, you know, always kind of looking at the game as a player, it sort of opened up my eyes to, to what, it, what it could be like to, you know, to be a head coach and getting, uh, getting into the coaching world. So you know, it really took till after my my playing days until I really started to, I guess, take it a little more seriously uh, to some extent. You know, post college, I my first job was with DC United uh, up here in the you know DMV area. Um, I moved here in 2008 after I got done with playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took a job in the front office selling tickets, <laughs> which for me uh, was a, just a great way to like be involved in soccer in some way. I think from working at DC United, it opened up doors for me that I didn't even know at the time uh, to get into coaching. I really just, beyond my day job, tried to coach as much as possible. Camps, clinics, United Soccer Club was a great free after school league that DC United partnered with Uh, a local organization to promote healthy lifestyles in the underserved communities. And I got involved with coaching in that program. Again, like looking back on that, it really just, you know, was a way for me to give back to the game and really just get introduced to this like crazy world of coaching that I didn't really know about, you know, beyond just being a player. Right. So, so being an accomplished coach, um, what was your, you know, you you finish playing, you get into the coaching side, you know, has it been littered with coaching schools, coaching education, or, you know, was it just the people that you were surrounded by? Yeah. So I think a little bit of both, right? So during that time at DC United, I also started, you know, my own coaching education journey. And, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, but so this was around, you know, 2008, 2009, but during that time, U.S. soccer 
you were still able to get a waiver where you could like skip mm -hmm. licenses or whatever it was uh, based on your playing experience. And uh, I remember, so I started with my F license because I, where, and I had an opportunity to wave into a higher license. And I just remember that moment was important for me because I had no, really like no formal experience on, on coaching. And I felt that it was important to really start from scratch, uh, learn uh, everything that I could. So instead of waiving that, I decided to do my F license during that time. Uh, and it was very helpful <laughs> in terms of learning structure, uh, around um, a training session, communication with players on a basic level, but still, um, you know, learning those aspects. I think also during that time, again, just trying to coach as much as possible. So I had some friends and even colleagues at DC United, Tommy Park, who coached at SAC uh, during the time, and he was the assistant coach at the Matha High School. I would just tag along at sessions to, to help run sessions, get exposed to like a, a organized environment. And I found that to be just, just so helpful, kind of just jumping into it and, and learning uh, as I go. I also felt it very important to like, you know, I remember driving down from Northern Virginia to like Prince William County to go watch sessions uh, of coaches that I started to hear about and respect and heard that they did a very good job. Yeah. I would go drive down and just help pick up cones, uh, play in activities because I was you know, still fit during that time. So I could just hop in. Um, yeah. and, and again, those things just really helped me to start building my base as a coach. You've probably been on the receiving end of this now, but those younger coaches coming to you saying, hey, I, I want to be good. What do I do? Do I do the U.S. soccer coaching path? Do I do the the formerly the you know the NSCAA or the United Soccer Coaching Path? Now they've kind of come together a little bit. Um, were you often asked that question? Yeah, um, and I still am right with coaches who are starting out. And personally, I've uh, done a lot of the U.S. soccer coaches. So in 2011, I completed my C license here in Virginia um, and thought that that was one of my favorite co uh, courses, to be honest. I thought it, it started to teach uh, more complex scenarios and things like that uh, right. compared to some of the other uh, courses. Uh, 2012, I took my national youth license. I actually, yeah. funny story, like traveled to Salt Lake City. The, the courses here were full in Virginia. So I decided to just uh, take a flight out to Salt Lake City and took my national youth license out there. And I found it to be an incredible experience, just learning from coaches who I didn't know uh, in an environment that I wasn't familiar with. Right. Uh, and I found that to be a, you know, again, looking back, something that was very positive for me. And by 2013, I had completed my B license, which I did down at Bradenton. When coaches ask me, especially younger coaches, about how to kind of get started on that journey and the coaching education. I just think that really any education is super important, you know, whether it's through U.S. soccer, whether it's through uh, NSCAA uh, uh, or USC. Now, um, I think that just getting started with it is super important. Whether you agree with what's being taught or not, <laughs> you know, because, you know, some people don't, but I, I personally believe that it's whether you believe it or not it's super important to to get the structure down it is extremely different from being a player and it's important to um you know i think to educate yourself uh early and often and, and i always say one of the one of the biggest takeaways to that is the the network you make right the, the people that you meet on these courses you, you stay connected with uh for a long long time it's amazing yeah so, it, it, it is something that, you know, I, I was talking to Tim earlier before we jumped on and I just the small network, right? It's a small world, uh, especially in the soccer world. And I think, you know, when you go on these courses too, like you do form those relationships that, you know, with like-minded people who are going yeah. through a same grind as you go through as a coach. Um, and it, it really does sort of, uh, you know, you build a, a a, a 
a relationship with people that lasts throughout, you know, yeah. if, if you make it a career and last throughout that whole time, you know, I find it helpful to just, you know, have that support system, right? Whether you're coaching or even if you're in the, on the administrative side of the sport or doing both, like it, it's always good to, to share ideas and uh, check in with people and things like that. I find it super important just as you go along. Uh, along the way, is there one player that you've worked with over your years that just stands out as the player? In addition to coaching at Alexandria Soccer, where I am now, uh, I'm actually uh, coaching our 2005 boys uh, currently. Um, and I've been at Alexandria Soccer since 2011. So I've coached, I, I think I've coached every age group on the boys and girls side at some point. I also got some experience coaching uh, high school uh, varsity girls program here at a local private school in this area. And a player that really stands out to me. So there's a player who, when I, my first year coming in as a head coach in the high school environment, a player by the name of Izzy Franklin, I look back on her because this is a really tough question, right? Like there's talented You're going to upset a lot of people that see this, Chris. If it's not them, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. But um, Izzy stands out to me. She was a player that, um, you know, I, I think she had decided early on that she wasn't necessarily going to try to play in college, even though she could have played at a top D1 school. Uh, yeah. Wanted to uh, – I think she's like a doctor now, <laughs> you know, but – you know, I look back on her as a player and just an extraordinary leader, uh, never complained. So, you know, I think over my years, right, like players that, you know, don't make excuses or complain about anything really are hard to come by, first of all. But when you do come across them, you don't forget about it. She always asked questions that were very relevant and like, you know, good questions, but never complained about things. Strong leader within the team. And for me as a coach coming into a high school environment, it was important, important for me to kind of set a culture, right, within uh, that environment. And I thought that she helped and understood the culture that I was trying to set. And, you know, I ended up coaching there for like six more years. And what was established in that first year continued on some of the things continued on throughout my experience there and I kind of look back and credit that to uh you know players like Izzy Franklin who you know just you know had the work ethic had the positive mentality and was just a, a beast on the field right like anything if we needed a goal uh that's the player who was going to do it if we needed uh uh, you know, a tackle at the last minute or a block, you know, or winning a header on a corner kick in the last minute, she was the player. And, yeah. and so that, that actually is, um, you know, who, who I look back on. Would she be uh, woven into your best coaching moment? Would she be included in that? Or was that on a different team? I look at my 2005 boys that I have currently, I think, you know, we won state cup a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. and it was just, it was an awesome moment, not beyond just, um, winning the game. I think for me, I was really proud of our club, um, you know, at Alexandria soccer. So some of these players have been with us since you five wreck, you know, wow. some of them, uh, a good core of the team has been together since you nine and have developed, um, you know, through a system that we teach here, right? Like we have uh, a style of play that we try to uh, teach starting at U9. And they were one of the first teams to go through our full uh, um, curriculum content starting at U9. Um, and to see them kind of reach that point, um, it was it was an awesome experience for me as a coach, right? And even you know, seeing some of their former coaches who had them at nines and tens, then 11s and 12s who were teaching them all the, all the right things. Great, great stuff to prepare them for 11 v 11, you know, and really at a U15 on the competitive side, being prepared um, uh, for that level. And so, you know, for me, just, 
just being proud of the club, the, the coaches who had them before, you know, and obviously to the family support, I think is something that is not talked about enough, but their parents, you know, put in a lot of effort and uh, bought into what we were doing and it all kind of culminated at the end. And it was a really cool moment. Well, it sounds a little atypical, the environment you're in and the environment you guys have been able to create at Alexandria. Um, you know, w- when you hear about youth soccer, or you're involved in youth soccer. There's so many clubs that just seem to be um, uh, kind of like uh, teams on their own islands. Right. So when you're you're working with them at a certain age group and you're passing them to the next um, is that there is there that consistency between philosophy and idea and, and club curriculum, whatever you want to call it, to continue them down the road that you have uh, that you the message you've tried to instill with them over that year or two years or three years or whatever you have. It sounds to me like at Alexandria, you have that consistency across the age groups which is so important. And maybe that's why you have the coaches that are, or the kids that are staying at the club for all those years. There just seems to be a ton of, ah, this team over here is winning. I'm going to jump clubs and go over here. And this year I'm going to go here because, you know, for whatever reason. So that's unique. Um, That's an interesting part of your story. Um, On the flip side of that, um, is there one moment that kind of stands out as the, ooh, (laughs) <laughs> that is, I, I hate to say the worst coaching moment, but, you know, we have to learn from the bad as well. Is there one? I'd say there's two. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the first thing I think for me uh, as a coach, I, you know, there are times, right, where uh, a disconnect in communication comes about between uh, particularly I think between coaches and players, right? Like, it, especially if you've maybe been with a team for, um, you know, uh, multiple years, right? right? Like typically we, you know, there's kind of this um, unknown rule, you know, almost like two years, you kind of recycle with a new coach. Um, sometimes it's longer, could be less. Um, but I think the times that, you um, you know, kind of a, a, a feeling of losing the team, um, I think is one of the worst experiences, but also uh, something that allows you to really reflect and learn as a coach. Um, I would say at some point we all go through it as coaches. Um, but I, I, do, I, I, over the years, have found that to be one of the most challenging things and um, um, you know, when maybe your ideas aren't getting across to the players or they're not bought in, they, you lose buy-in. Um, and it can feel like you're on an island, (laughs) you know, and, um, you know, I think that what we were talking about earlier in terms of having a support system as well, is like, it's super important where you can connect with, uh, other coaches or, uh, coaches if you, you formed relationship relationships with over the years, um, I think it's important to be able to, to, to share, you know, and, and um, learn and, uh, you know, really just prepare yourself for the future and how you can improve that. But, you know, I've had it happen a couple of times. And um, again, like it's, it's, a, it's tough, but it's also a great learning um, opportunity. Um, you know, and I, I'd also mention as well, so I, I, I sort of hit on the parent interaction. I think the negative pa- parent interactions who, you know, we've all had, um, I think those are always tough to deal with as well because it, it you know, you can sit on it personally, like you can take it personally. Um, and at times those can be challenging to work through. I, I again, I mentioned like the, uh, relationship with the, the parents are so important in this process, this whole development process. It's like, it's key. Um, and I think, um, when, when there is again, some disconnect in communication, it can be very challenging. Um, and so I just, um, you know, again, it's one of those moments that it's a tough moment, but it's also, uh, an important learning moment in your development as a coach. 
Um, so sure. those would be two that I would mention is, is kind of the more challenging situations to deal with. One of the things our audience has really uh, come to enjoy is, is this next question I'm going to ask you. Training game. What is your maybe go-to? What is your favorite? What do you feel um, is one of your best tools for teaching a, a certain moment of the game that you, you deem important? Is there a training game or two that you enjoy? And, and if you could kind of explain that and give us a, a good picture of what it looks like. So if you don't mind, I have three, <laughs> but uh, Great. the more the merrier. So go yeah. on. Um, I'll, I'll kind of start with, with rondos, right? So like just a staple at our club and um, really for me as a coach, which I think over the years have learned to appreciate the nuances that rondos can teach a player and, it, and how much of the actual game you can uh, get out of a rondo. I think as a player, a rondo is just like, you know, a fun game and you didn't want to be in the middle. Uh, and and uh, I think now that we're looking at it from a coaching perspective and my coaching lens, there's just so many different um, skills, uh, decision-making and thought process that goes on within a rondo. Um, how you're receiving the ball, the, your positioning, um, how you're passing a ball. Um, defensively, if you're in the middle, how you are working with your teammate uh, to uh, get the ball back. Uh, I think even just teaching a style of play, not losing the ball um, is something that you can really just um, stress in, in the Rondo. But, you know, for me, like, I think, obviously it's small box. You set it up. I think it's really important. Like we use the quick goal, the flat cones. We, we use those in the Rondo. So it helps with not getting in the way. Right. So like, also, like what I've learned over the years as a coach, I have pet peeves, like little things that just drive me crazy out on the field. So like one of those things are if you use a, a disc code in a rondo and a, a pass is made and the ball pops up and it like pops over a kid's foot and rolls out of bounds and it sort of messes up the rhythm. Right. Um, those are like something like that, something as small as that to me does mess up the rhythm of an activity. So you know, being able to use flat cones where you're able to like, there's no distraction within the activity I find is, um, it's super helpful. You know, it just allows for the rhythm to continue and, you know, small detail, but something that I think, um, what I have found, it goes a, a long way, uh, in a simple activity. Um, so I, I do, um, I did want to mention that. And I, you know, another activity that I really like, like uh, is 4v4 plus three. So we do this positional game quite a bit. Um, and again, it's, it's one of these activities that, you know, you're set up in two teams of four, you have three neutral players. Um, and again, brings out just a lot of concepts that we try to communicate to our players. Um, I think on a basic level, there's, you know, it's a uh, possession based activity. Um, but, you know, when you get more nuanced, you know, one of the things that I really like about the activity is the team that's in possession working on breaking lines of pressure or switching from one side of the field to the next and making that sort of killer pass that's able to break, you know, three or four players from the opponent. Um, and, you know, I think um, we really judge, you know, in a lot of ways, like you're able to judge your team's ability of understanding the concepts through that activity because everything mm -hmm. comes out. Um, but over the years, so we used to do that activity quite a bit without goals. Um, and it was just more of a possession based activity. Um, but over the years, we um, added in goals on the ends. Um, and big goals or small goals. So small sided goals. Um, we typically, so I use them right now, especially with the older team with like 77 small sided goals. Um, okay. and, um, put them at the end and, you know, it, it's just, 
<laughs> it's just such a great activity. But within that activity, you're able to get the um, sort of the realism of the game by scoring goals. And it keeps the players obviously just, you know, more than engaged because they want to score. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's, 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 you know, if we use the small side of goals, really easy to manipulate and move and set up to where they need to be. Um, but also like at times, if we have enough space, we can use the full sided goals and bring them in with wheels, <laughs> you know, and it's just very easy to transition from, you know, uh, one activity to the next without having to like interrupt or disrupt the session, uh, too much. Right. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. And I guess just one more too. I, like, so we, we actually do a lot of, um, you know, we'll have, I'll have parts of my activity, especially in our, our club does as well, where we, you know, rehearse, you know, patterns within the game uh, that uh, really as a collective activity that allows the team and helps the team to get on the same page. Uh, and sometimes we will do these activities without pressure. So you'll have, you know, 10 V zero or 11 V zero, uh, just rehearsing, um, different patterns within the game and, uh, in concepts that we want to see come out in the game environment. Um, but, you know, we will, uh, in replace it, you know, of actual live defenders will use the poles. Um, we'll use the poles from quick goal, uh, or the mannequins that, uh, you know, sort of just, it allows the player to, to see, um, you know, the cues, <laughs> you know, it just helps them to visualize the cues, um, and, and, uh, how to time their movements and, uh, all these different things, um, that, you know, if you don't have enough players or you just want to work on, like with no pressure, it, it allows you to do that. Um, and again, the, the flat cones too, super important in that, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, because right. We like to set up, um, vertical zones that, yeah. you know, again, for positioning, help the players see on the field and visualize, you know, um, how and what their positioning should be especially off the ball. Um, and the flat cones, again, doing that on a half of a field, doing pattern play on half of a field with flat cones allows, there's just no disruption. You know, it's not, like I said, hitting cones and bouncing and all these different things. Uh, and I find that to be super helpful. It sounds like you've had an incredible journey and, and you, you've done it in a way that most would find to be the right way. Is there anything you would change? Is there, you know, what would you tell your younger self? Yeah, I think getting, getting started even earlier with the formal coaching education, uh, that is something that I would have liked to do in college right away. I actually had some college teammates that started their coaching education journey uh, around their freshman year. And okay. I was just kind of like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, just in looking back, I, I, I wish I would have done that. I think um, it's a great time to do it, especially if you are playing in college or um, even just at school, you know, during that time sure. or even younger now, right? Like as a U16 player, starting with your early, you know, with the grassroots licensing and things like that, I find is really be beneficial. Uh, down the line. So that is one thing that I, I would have gotten started with earlier. And I think just being a sponge though, right? Like soaking things up for younger coaches, especially like, I feel I did it a bit, but I would have liked to do it more is just going out, observe sessions, work for free, <laughs> you know, go pick, pick up cones, set up activities and, and, and learn from coaches who are currently doing it. Right. write things down. Um, I think taking notes, those are things that I think I, I did to an extent, but not enough. Um, and, um, you know, looking back is something that I would, um, you know, try to do a little bit more of. Well, listen, uh, this has been fantastic. Once again, Chris Arnold, the 2019 club champions, Boys Coach of the Year. It's been a pleasure. And if we come knocking, would you be up for doing it again? 
Yeah, man, anytime. Uh, this was fun. Don't get too much time to kind of to reflect back and talk about these things. So this was an awesome conversation. I really appreciate it, Eric. Perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. We'll talk again soon. Have a good All one. Right, take care. Thanks.